Hi, you here. How are you going? Are we up and running? Yes. All right, so quickly, a lot of you already know me. Um, my name's Elaine, and I have Animal Wellness, which is just next door over there on the corner. You're welcome to go and have a look through the garden. We have a few herbs and things like aloe and um, some oregano's growing quite well. You might find a passion fruit if you're lucky. So you feel free to go and have a look through the garden. Oh, we have some really nice um, um, curry leaves to cook with. That's just near the gazebo there. So it's kind of like a little local garden thing. Um, so this is me, and I've been a practicing vet since 1981, so quite a few years. Um, before I opened this local practice, I did referral practice in Sydney and Adelaide, and I've taught vets um, acupuncture and dentistry around the world pretty much. So those are my two areas that I've specialised in. Um, I was asked to give this lecture to the behaviour group um, a few months ago. So that we have a specialist meeting down on the Gold Coast once a year. And um, because I've had a bit of experience with the microbiome transplants through a friend of mine in Boston, who actually started doing this about 20 odd years ago, um, that's somehow people knew that, that I knew about this, so that's why I had to prepare this lecture for them. And I thought, okay, so that's where we're at. We're now using um, more knowledge about the gut biome to help treat all medical conditions nowadays. And you'll see why as we go through this. So basically, people are what's called symbionts. Symbionts mean that we are animals that are communicating with other animals that live with us, inside us, and on us. And so we have good bacteria throughout our body, on our skin and in our guts, particularly also in the other parts like the vagina and any openings basically that allows um, bacteria to grow in a moist environment. Sounds a bit yucky, but there's good bugs and there's bad bugs as you will see. So our skin is covered with bacteria and our intestines are full of them. Not only bacteria, but certain fungi and bacteriophages. Those are like viruses that live on bacteria. So basically, we are more bacteria than we are human by numbers. We have 90 trillion bacteria living inside of us, and we're only 10 trillion by number human. So we're more bacteria than we are human. So 90% bacteria. Animal studies have shown that the gut bugs affect our behavior. So this is very interesting. And there, every day there's new links that come up um, on the internet. I read last week about Parkinson's, possibly being caused by a certain gram-negative bacteria. Alzheimer's disease, they're actually listing a possibility of bacteria being involved with that. So some definitions as we go through our talk this morning. Um, probiotics. Probiotics are actually the good bugs, the pro, the good, that suppress the growth of the bad bugs in our bodies. Prebiotics are the nutrients that allow the good bugs to grow. So these are natural fiber ingredients um, that resist digestion and are not broken down so that the food particles are easily absorbed. They sit in your gut and allow the bacteria to grow on them. Symbiotics is actually the synergistic combination of the probiotics and the prebiotics. So you will read some marketing that says we have symbiotics in us. So what that means is they've got something like inulin plus some probiotics in the powder that help it grow faster, which is actually a good thing because if you're buying something that actually just has the probiotics in it, it's got to get past your acid stomach into your large intestine and it has to multiply to actually be any good because your stomach acid will break down a whole bunch of the bacteria and kill a lot of them because your pH is around three and the bacteria like to live in the lower bowel with a pH of around eight. So you need to have the bugs get there, which is why the FMBT, which is fecal microbiome transplant, which is putting shit up the bum, <laughs> works because you're actually getting the probiotic up the bum. So this is an area that um, I helped a vet in Boston work with. So what we ended up doing is taking her standard poodles for a walk around the lake every morning and picking up the poo, 
and taking it into work and putting it in one of those little target plastic containers and whizzing it up and then taking a syringe and shoving it up the bump of pretty much most of her patients. And so she was using this for her atopy dogs, so the skin allergy dogs, the um, behavior problems, so the anxious dogs, um, her cancer patients, etc. So you want to make sure that you're putting good poo up the bum. And her dogs were fed roadkill, basically. So people would go, she was a vegan, so she didn't want to buy meat. But her clients um, in that area in Massachusetts would sometimes hit a deer and she had huge freezers and they'd bring it to her and she'd chop it up and freeze it. So if you freeze a lot of these um, types of wild animal meats, you will destroy a lot of the parasites that are in them. So that's a good thing. And she was feeding mostly raw and they were very healthy. Her dogs, her standard poodles lived to be you know, 13, 14, 17. So in our society nowadays, the large breed dogs are kind of lucky to live past 10, 11, 12. So we see a lot of cancer nowadays and I believe that this is linked to bad bugs in the gut, glyphosate, and I'll talk more about this as we go, and um, the commercial foods. So we talk a lot about that at our clinic. And um, too much um, pesticides in agriculture, chemicals, worming, heartworm injections, um, etc. Okay. So there's lots of different types of um, bugs in the gut and each individual will have a specific unique formula of bugs in their gut. You can actually, as a human, have a test done on your poo to analyze what bugs are in there. Some of our naturopath um, clients have actually had that done over time. So um, oh, just before I go on, so Ross and Catherine and myself are all naturopaths. We all graduated from Australian Institute of Applied Science. So they'll be talking to you more about the human aspect. Mine is a kind of overall talk about all of this. Um, so you will have a balance of good and bad bugs. Everybody will have some bad bugs in there. So what you really want is around at least 70% good bugs, and these are gram positive as opposed to the gram negatives, and I'll go into that a little bit more. So that's how you identify bacteria. It's, it's called a gram stain, and this is a laboratory type of test that they do um, that was invented by a guy called Gram. <laughs> His last name was Gram. It was in 1938, roughly, when he invented the gram stain. So it's to do with the type of cell wall around the outside of the bacteria and what type of stain it takes up. So the gram positives take up a stain and they have a thicker wall and a better wall and then the gram negatives have a thinner wall. They can reproduce faster apparently, the gram negatives, and that's why they can be quite dangerous. And the gram negatives take up a um, red stain and the gram positives take up a blue stain. So we'll show you that later. So as we journey through the mouth down to the anus, we see a difference in the number of bacteria per mil or per gram. And in the, st in the stomach, there's 100 bacteria per gram. In the small intestine, around about 100,000. And in the large intestine, 100 million per gram or per mil. Now, when you've got a dirty mouth with periodontal disease, broken teeth, dental abscesses, which is kind of what we specialize in at our clinic, every time that animal or human bites down or even closes their mouth with any pressure, they push bacteria in directly into the blood. And so you will get 50,000 colony forming units of bacteria per mil of blood when you've got bad teeth. And that is a constant insult to the liver and the kidney. This is why we're so big on um, on actually working through making sure that everybody has good teeth and sound teeth and why our dogs and cats um, are actually looked at carefully to have those bad teeth removed if they need to be removed. So the bacteria in the mouth and in the gut are living off what we eat. So if you get an increase of bacteria in the small intestine, it's called small intestine bowel overgrowth or SIBO. Who's heard of that term? Okay, some hands have, yeah. So that's kind of bandied around a fair bit, and so I thought that um, probably Ross and Catherine will talk about that a bit later, a bit more. 
So the gut microbiome has some very important actions. It's important to regulate allergic reactions, which is why in Boston we were using uh, fecal microbiome transplants for allergic skin disease. It maintains the gut motility. So if you've got a lot of gram negatives living in your large bowel, you will have diarrhea because it's inflammation that pushes that through. If you've got an animal that has had diarrhea, you'll sometimes see mucus coming through and sometimes blood. So that's the cells of the large bowel secreting that mucus to try and get the bad bugs out. And then the bleeding is because you, they've actually penetrated through some of the vessels. So you have the microvascular irritation that bleeds. Um, the importance of the bowel is also in maintaining mood. That's because your gut cells in your small intestine and large intestine actually secrete hormones. They secrete serotonin, which is your happy feel good. So this increase that we now have of depression and anxiety and mental health disease is very likely, in my opinion, related to food, processed flour, wheat and glyphosate. Glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. What happens to your gut when you take an antibiotic? Right. So you're going to kill your good bugs and your bad bugs. When you kill your good bugs, what happens? So you have this, yeah, you have this balance of good bugs and bad bugs. So when you have a killing off of your good bugs, then your bad bugs are allowed to grow. And so when you have more bad bugs, you end up not being able to have serotonin and you have less B12 and B vitamins because that's also what happens with those bacteria. Less vitamin K2, which also helps your hormone balance and also fights autoimmune diseases. So if you've got good B vitamins and K vitamins and also these little small elements that come out of the bacteria, so the bacteria poo is actually good for us. <laughs> Most of them, the good bugs. So these are short chain fatty acids. There's more about that as it comes through. Our brain and our mitochondria need the fatty acids to work properly and they need those short chain fatty acids. So, and we don't actually make them ourselves. The bacteria make them out of the food that we eat. Okay, as we keep going. So the bacteria also therefore help with your feel good and they help with your weight ma maintenance. So that if you're wiping out your good bugs regularly, you have low serotonin, you need to feel happy, so you'll go and eat chocolate ice cream. <laughs> so it's what your gut tells Guilty. you that you need. <laughs> you will eat more sugar because your bad bugs in your bowel are telling you, feed me, feed me. The bad bugs like simple sugars. The good bugs will eat complex carbohydrates and some proteins and other things. So you're, if you've got a sugar craving, you could be chromium and vanadium deficient. Those are two trace minerals that are fairly low in our environment. But you probably have an overgrowth of bad bugs because you're not feeling happy. You don't have enough serotonin and you don't have enough serotonin because you don't have good bugs. So, um, yeah, and the good bugs also help make those fatty acids and fatty acids are important because there's two types of vitamins, water soluble and fat soluble. So if you don't have fat, you can't absorb vitamin A, D, E and K. Those are the fat soluble vitamins. So nothing works if you don't have good bugs. They also help protect infection um, and production of antibodies. Right, this is some of the mouths that we see regularly, very often. At least weekly, sometimes daily, or more. So what can happen, let me see if my pointer thing works. So they might have gone to some vets or just looked themselves and said, oh yeah, my dog's mouth is fine, but he smells. So you can see just a little, little teeth there. And sometimes, you know, it's not really anyone's fault because the dog won't let you look because it hurts. <laughs> so I try and get everybody to look at their dog's mouth regularly. And the trick is to not open the mouth, to slide the lip back here. And probably wear a glove. <laughs> <laughs> but if the dog's <laughs> mouth smells, there is a problem. And uh, end of story, because these are the self-reproducing bacteria 
that make this really bad smell and they're gram negatives. So if your dog has a bad smell, there's a problem and you should go to the vet. And you should do that regularly. You should check your animal's smell regularly. So here's a little story about the gram positives and the gram negatives, yeah? And that's how they make the stain. So the gram positives are that nice pretty blue purple and the gram negatives are that. So we know what a dysbiosis is. So this was one of my um, lectures when I was teaching more dentistry. And the reason I put the slide in to show you how bacteria feed bacteria and that interaction and the micro niche that happens in the mouth. So what happens is we have a tooth here, we have gum or gingiva here, and at the top there is oxygen in the mouth. So this is a periodontal pocket. And what happens is close to the opening of the periodontal pocket, there's oxygen, and these bacteria can grow really well. And they have some really neat names for scrabble. Poor fibromonas, you don't have enough tiles for that. But poor fibromonas is the bug that makes the color staining in Maltese and white dogs and Bichon Frise. So you'll see that red staining. Poor fire means the color pigment, right? So the iron is sort of pigment. So they take iron from the blood and they make that pigment staining that you'll see regularly. So these bacteria, the first ones that grow there, these are bacterium and peptis, streptococcus and porphyromonas. And the neat thing is they'll cause inflammation and from the gingival fluid and you'll get some hemoglobin coming across and then that will allow their poo and their pee of the bacteria to come out and they will make these things called spermin, putrescine, isobutyrate, and thiamine. Thiamine is a B vitamin. So these bugs will make thiamine. And what happens with the thiamine in the periodontal pocket is it allows gram negatives to grow. So the gram positives feed the gram negatives, but they also feed the body, the human body. So, and then when these things start to grow, then they cause bone destruction, and that's how you end up losing your teeth. So what we want to do is we want to keep that area clean. We don't want a little micro niche of bacteria growing. We want to scrape out that calculus and that plaque on a daily basis. So we want to eat things that are mildly abrasive to our teeth so that you don't get a buildup of food and debris on your teeth. So that's why we recommend the things that we do for the dog. Make sense? And they also secrete things that cause a biofilm that allows the other bugs to grow. So we do recommend a prey model, but we do talk to the clients about supervised bone chew. Don't feed antlers. I've had various vets that want to feed them to their own dog, and in the end, they did break their teeth. As I told them, they wouldn't, but you know, who listens to the boss? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what you want is this sort of rib bone works really well. They tend to not break their teeth on the rib bone. Oh, why is that? There, this thing, next slide. Because it tends to do this, it tends to not break the bone. So you want the young lamb type of bones because the, their bones are a bit softer. And you want to supervise it. And look, it doesn't matter about that. People are like, I don't have time to take the bone out and defrost it and give it to my dog. No, well, look, Alaska, Canada, there's frozen out there. You just throw it out, and as it's thawing, the dog can feel it. But you do have to know your dog, because I've, I've told um, a Labrador puppy owner who you think the Labrador puppy was about 16, 18 weeks, and I gave them this little talk about that. And the dog swallowed the whole room. <laughs> and so they went to emergency because they were really worried. And they took an x-ray. And there's a whole rib in the little puppy's stomach. And they're like, well, we can anesthetize and go in with a gastroscope and take it out. Oh, the bone always has to be raw, by the way. Um, the dog's fine just sitting in the cage. And so while they're discussing laparotomy and cutting the dog open, the dog regurgitated the bone. It was fine. <laughs> I've also had a nurse who's big dog swallowed the whole carcass of the chicken. The chicken frame's very good. And she ended up taking it to um, the university when it was at St. Lucia. And the same thing, x-ray. And I'm like, well, why did you do that? Like, the stomach acid is around pH of two or three. If it's a large dog and a chicken frame, it's not going to be there in another day or so. That chicken frame will be completely digested. If you want to prove this to yourself, take a chicken bone, put it in a glass, and fill the glass with some vinegar, and just watch. 
that's what happens. And that's why when we tell people to make bone broth, that um, they, they, the understanding that they'll get when they make the bone broth is by adding vinegar to the bone broth, it'll break down the collagen and you'll get the effect of, say, when you open a tin of salmon and there's all those bones in there and they're really soft and they're bone powder and you can eat those. Same thing with bone broth. After you cook your bone broth for a day or two, I think Catherine's going to talk about bone broth later. No, she's not open. <laughs> so you just take a big pot, a uh, slow cooker, you throw the bones in, fill it with water, add several tablespoons of vinegar. We usually use apple cider vinegar. And you turn it on, you go to bed. You don't have to stand over it. The, the slow cooker does everything for you. Yeah, that's the best way. You let it cool down the next day. You pick up the bones with your fingers, you crumble them. Anything that's chunky, you throw away. The rest that's all powder is fine. Then you add your vegetables. Also, if there's a lot of fat on some bones, too much fat. So you'll let it cool and you'll scoop the fat off and chuck it away. Bone broth is a very good way to get started. Okay, so how does this work? So there's your gut lining. And there is, um, this is, this is the poo in the intestine area, that's the brush border. So there is a nerve, it's the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. It has a direct effect into the hypothalamus, so that's that little picture blown up over there. So there's little nerve endings all the way through your gut that connect directly to your brain. And that's where the term comes from, that I have gut instinct. My gut tells me something. So the way that I'm seeing this now is from a recent work from Daniel Keown, K-E-O-W-N, and he talks about the body electric. Anybody read his work? I'm going to Poland to see him. He's doing the talks, yeah, in Poland. So, so what I'm seeing is that if you take the gut and you just laid it out and stretched it out. It's the size of a huge tennis court. That's how big the surface area is. So I'm thinking this is an electrical receiver of information. And people are like, oh, that's really weird. That doesn't make sense. Well, think about it. If you turn on the television, you're getting waves from somewhere, maybe wherever they're sending them, and you're seeing an image and a sound on your TV. So how does that work? It's waves, right? And so I think all of this distance healing and all of this gut instinct is possibly connected to just quantum waves. So if we come across someone that you feel a bit icky or a bit weird about, and it's your gut telling you this, there's probably wave interactions that are coming through and your gut is reading it and sending this message to your brain. So I'm just putting that out there. Yeah. Because we see all the time dogs and cats that come into our clinic, and I have some amazing staff, two of them are sitting over here, that are really good with the massage for the dogs and cats, and they're just really calm. And I know that if I have to take blood from an animal, I want those in the room with me. <laughs> so they come in and like, fine, you know, because they've got they've also got years of experience handling animals, and they've also studied tons and tons of um, different things about animal care. So, so all that knowledge and all that knowing is in the gut of these people that work with me. <laughs> and so the animal, I think, picks up the energy and the wavelengths that are coming across from their brain or their gut. And so the animals quite often are very well behaved for us compared to other places, or we're told that anyway. So, and I think that's how that works, like from a quantum, you know, bi-directional way. So the vagus nerve is the um, mind-body connection. And I think it's that physical manifestation of the soul, if you want to give it that. Because we know sometimes when people have, um, I'm just, just thinking I can word this, passed on or brain dead temporarily to the EEGs, but then brought back again, they still saw things, they still knew things, they still heard things. So how could that happen if the EEG said their brain was dead? So I think this is the gut connection and maybe they can't measure where the 10th cranial nerve goes in on the EEGs. I'm not sure, but there are many cases of people that were declared dead, brain dead, but they've come back to life and they can tell you that 
nurse Susan did this and Dr. Robert did this and I saw it all from the ceiling. So that I think is quite fascinating. Again, I think this is that body electric thing. So there is that cross pattern. Let me go back. So the, the gut tells us what's going on, but the brain also goes back to the gut. So it's a bi-directional pathway. So if an animal is really stressed, and you'll, you'll see this and they're panting a lot and their pupils are dilated, so that's a sympathetic response. The vagus nerve has the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So the sympathetic system is the adrenaline and the fight, flight, fright, and the parasympathetic is the rest <coughs> and digest. So when the brain is thinking, oh my God, I've got to run away from that lion that's going to eat me, like the bad bed with the vaccination needle, then the gut's going to go out. So sometimes we'll have animals that are pre-programmed to be fearful at vet clinics, and they'll come in and just do you know benign stuff, and they'll have diarrhea. So that's how that works, because the fright and flight switched on, it tells the gut, increase your propulsion, because I've got to make my body lighter so I can get out of here faster. So some people may have actually experienced that if they've um, had exams and they have exam tension, they have to go to the toilet lots before they go and sit their exam. So that's the same thing. So if you want a really quick trick to help with this one, if you just put light pressure on your eyeball and breathe really slowly and really deeply for three breaths, <coughs> try that now. So close your eyes and put your fingers on your eyeballs. Don't push really hard, just very lightly. Breathe in, raise your chest up and also when you breathe in, drop your diaphragm so your stomach comes out. So big breath and breathe out. Do it again. What you want to do is breathe in for three and out for five and a two second in between that. So we'll do it again. Again, sorry, breathe in. One, two, three, hold, breathe out. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. So what you've done is reset your parasympathetic system. So I, I did this with my mum who had atrial fibrillation quite often. And every time she went to the doctors, the atrial fibrillation had been keeping her up all night and she finally got there and she was tired and it wouldn't show up on the halter, but I could feel it on her pulse. So I simply did that and um, she was fine. So you could feel it on her pulse. So, so that's a good thing that you can do. And if you're working with um, a dog or a cat, you can lightly um, press on their closed eyelids, but you can also, I teach a massage course, by the way, once or twice a year. There's a spot at the top of your head here, right in the middle where the fontanelle is, which is closed on everyone, hopefully. And you push backwards this way, yeah? You see what's called? <laughs> and that's called Governor Vessel 20, and going against the flow, calms it down, and then there's two points behind your neck as well, called gallbladder 20. So if you do really slow circles there, it can also stimulate the parasympathetic so what we're all about today is about restoring the gut health. And so some of the things that you can do are microbiome transfers. And they are actually doing this for infants in the ICU. So um, babies that are born um, by C-section have a different microbiome to those that come out of the vagina. So they're actually swabbing the vagina of these women and putting the swab in the baby's mouth to help receive the microbiome some hospitals. Some women are actually doing that. There's a microbiome on the breast as well, so that um, chest to chest and skin to skin of newborns is also really important, and that's part of the problem. They're not doing that in some areas, but I think most hospitals are now aware of that. So my friend Margot Roman, who has a website called Eat shit and live, but the shit is like a <laughs> And her vet hospital is called MASH because it's Massachusetts, whatever. Um, and so if you Google her, um, she calls herself Dr. Do More as opposed to Dr. Do Little. And um, she, 20 years ago, was doing even probably more microbiome transplants. 
So she was at a rock concert in LA sitting next to some head pediatricians and she told them about this and this is actually how it's come about through those connections and so you never know what you guys will end up doing, you know, it's who you know, what you know and how you talk to people about things. It's all very fascinating. So we're at the bottom of this growth industry. So Chris is aware that with his, um, he works with his business Buchu and that business is continuing to grow quite well I imagine. Um, so all of this kombucha and all of this is, is an offshoot of what we now know about the microbiome and how that comes about. Okay, so keep going. So there is an interesting condition in children called PANDAS. You may or may not have heard about it. PANDAS is an acronym for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. So that's a bad bug. Um, and it's also from a mycoplasma. It's basically, it's an autoimmune disease. So what did we say about vitamin D and K? It's made by the good bugs. So a lot of children have antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. They've got a cold, a flu, they go to the doctor, they get a script. Hopefully the doctors aren't doing that as much. Because really what they should be doing is, here's some vitamin D3, go and get some sun, eat better, have some chopped liver, have chicken soup, you know, um, have some yogurt, have some kombucha. Kids really like kombucha, by the way. <laughs> it's good. It's like, it's good for you and it's like fizzy drink, yeah? Um, so feel free to sample all of the ones we've got. So, and I also believe that the glyphosate probably is part of the story. A lot of kids like um, breads and cookies and cakes and they're all made with flour and there's glyphosate in everything. So any flour, basically, in Australia. Um, and the other thing about flour is it used to have iodine, used to be iodinized, and so was the salt. But they've now found that bromide was cheaper, um, so there is bromide in flour now instead. Bromide directly affects the thyroid. The thyroid takes all of the halogenated compounds. So the thyroid wants iodine, but if it can have iodine, and iodide, anything that's in that periodic table in that line, so fluoride, chloride, bromide, it will just suck it up. So your thyroid can be damaged by those toxins, which actually do destroy tissue. You know, when you go, that's why they're in the swimming pool, that's why they're in the drinking water, that's why they put chloride, chlorine in the pool. So when your thyroid takes up the chlorides instead, or the fluorides, then you end up with Hashimoto's. Okay, so the pandas is probably correlated with medi medication of destroying the good bugs. So the treatment for pandas is probiotics. So some pretty pictures compared to all the words. So um, this is a picture of the gut lumen and this is how you get the size of a tennis court out of your gut when you stretch it. Because we've got all of these little villuses, villi, and if you stretch them out, like an accordion, then you'll have a very large surface area. You need a really large surface area to absorb the goodness out of the food. So people that have had bowel surgery and had lots of guts removed, they have a lot of problem absorbing, so they have to have very high dense liquid food to be able to get the nutrients into them. So normal healthy villi look like that. Damaged villi looks like that. So you can't get the nutrients in because all of this is plasmacytic, lymphocytic, um, white cells. These are pus, pus cells yep, that are produced by the body for the inflammation. So this is, this is a celiac patient. So I have had some celiac patients that had not been diagnosed, or actually they were on the biopsy, but the, med, the um, information didn't get through to the owner of the biopsy. <laughs> so when I was a student, I had this one um, client that had chronic diarrhea 10 to 12 times a day. And I said, bring in everything. So I said, look at all your file. And I looked through the file out of like seven biopsies. One, which I highlighted, like I spent all night reading through her file. It was crazy. And that's why you should pay your naturopath well. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so I got through there and one of them said indicative of celiac. And so I highlighted and saw her the next appointment and said, okay, so did your doctor tell you you needed to be gluten free 
and she said, no. What was her breakfast? Toast. What was her lunch? Sandwiches. What was her um, snacks? Oreo cookies and tea. I'm like, well, no wonder. So completely gluten-freed her. And this actually works for a lot of people that are not celiac, by the way. And um, within two weeks, she was <coughs> not having diarrhea, which was pretty outstanding. We did some other things too, but I just thought, read your medical reports carefully. And a lot of things get missed quickly. So that's why I always ask to get all the history of all my vet patients before I see them. Because we're second and third opinions and referrals mostly. So when they come in to me, I ask my nurses, don't I, <laughs> to make sure that we've got them there on file and then I'll go and read through them. And very often it'll say something like T4 less than 10. And so I'll go in and have a talk to the client and say, um, so your dog doesn't have a thyroid. Did they mention that to you? And oh no, nobody said that. Because it's right at the bottom of the lab report. There's a lot of stuff on top and somehow or other, there's this, and then there's a copy and paste from all the labs, and the copy and paste says, um, you know, T4 um, can be indicative if it's got signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism there, but then there's like four paragraphs after. It's very easy to miss, very easy. Yeah. So the pyrus patches on the guts are the bits that have the inflammatory cells and the way that the body fights infection. <coughs> So what damages the villi that caused all those white cells that we saw that were passed before? So antibiotics destroy the good bugs, and very low GI diets also make a diet that the bugs don't have anything to eat and they starve. So this is actually quite important for people that are on a low glycemic index diet, like a, like a paleo mostly meat diet. Okay, so if if you're on a paleo diet and you're eating lots of vegetables, um, you're probably okay because most vegetables have some starch in them. But if you're just eating meat and eggs and fat, you're probably going to end up with some autoimmune disease down the track because you won't be able to have the nice bugs over time. And there is an increased risk of bowel cancer if you're eating a lot of red meat. So I'm not a vegan. I have been a vegan various stages, but I wasn't very healthy on that. And some people actually cannot be a complete vegan. So a lot of my vegan clients, I try to get them to eat eggs and just raise chickens in their backyard. <laughs> I know, it's going to take a while to go over all that. Um, so <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> drugs that deplete the microbiome also cause a lot of problems. Um, and these drugs are antacids. I do see a lot of vet patients that come to me that are on antacids. Omeprazole, those sort of azoles, um, they're counterproductive because if you don't have stomach acid, you won't be able to digest. You need stomach acid, especially if you're a meat eater, to break down um, the, the good food that's in there so that when it gets to the next stage, which is the small intestine, that the enzymes from the small intestine can continue to do their work. So you need stomach acid. So this. Um, this is a, it's a bit of a red herring. So people do this because there's reflux and pain. The reason there's reflux is often because the body is low in magnesium, not enough green leafy vegetables, basically. Um, magnesium helps the peristalsis and it helps relax. So if you're also very tight and very stressed because your parasympathetic is not working properly because your sympathetic is overdrive. So this is where the natural pathway of looking at things comes in. So in some of those little white fluffies that have a lot of anxiety because they've got separation anxiety and the owners have gone to work for 12 hours a day. So they're like, <laughs> and they're looking every time a car comes by, is mum back, is mum back, is mum back. So they will often have gut issues. They'll have hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, all that. So we have to address the cause. You have to get to the cause. So if the cause is stress, you need to work on that. So just giving something like an antacid is not gonna help it in the long run, yeah? This is a lovely picture of how the body makes zonulin. So there's this thing that naturopaths talk about, which is leaky gut syndrome. Now this is not recognized by the general medical profession, but this is a really nice picture of what it is. So when you have inflammation in here, these cells release a product themselves. It's a little, kind of an enzyme really, called zonulin, and zonulin makes the gap bigger 
unfortunately, and then you can have pure proteins come into the bloodstream and then that increases the likelihood of getting autoimmune diseases. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not putting these food substances into our diet. Gliadin is a protein from wheat. But we also think that the gliadin plus the glyphosate is possibly to blame for this. And that's why if you read the packet of all the pet foods, in bold but very, very small writing will be wheat, wheat flour, right? So that's why a lot of our gut stuff, we don't carry a lot of dry food for that reason. So we want everyone to be making their own food to eliminate the agent in life so as much as possible. There's a um, doctor called Stephanie Seneff. If you want to go down this rabbit hole, she's got some really great webinars and um, PowerPoints online. Stephanie Seneff is an MIT doctor graduate and um, she's really unpacked this glyphosate story very well. Stephanie who? Seneff. Seneff. This one. Ah, right. Yeah. This one. Stephanie Seneff. in the small intestine produce um, some sorts of gases and you will get a bloating and gastric reflux. So those are symptoms that are an indicator that you probably need more of the good bugs to break it down to produce less of that toxic outload. And um, sometimes you need some vitamins and B12 is a commonly low level in many animals and people. So whenever we see gut issues, we will help um, by giving an injection of B12. So apparently, and I didn't know this until a month or so ago, you can buy B12 at the chemist without a script. <coughs> and there are three main types of B12. There's hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin, and cyanocobalamin. The mitochondria <coughs> does not like the cyanide component as much, although it's very helpful if you're fighting cancer because B17 is a cyanide compound which is in the seeds of fruit um, and mitochondria of cancer cells are very rapidly growing and rapidly digesting and when you're eating a B17 <coughs> amount it gets into those cancer cells and helps kill them and stops the spread of cancer so B17 is good and not good in some ways. Um, but for a healthy mitochondria, you do need good quality B vitamins and B12 particularly. Hydroxycobalamin is probably more universally acceptable for the cells. Um, so those that are having a bit of difficulty with the heavy metals and things, you probably want to inject yourself with the hydroxy. And also, if you have an appointment with um, Catherine, she does a lot of genetic <coughs> testing um, through 23andMe and other sources and can run through and biohack um, what your particular body might need. And everybody is a little bit different that way. So anybody know who this is? Who is that? Yeah. There you go for you. This is a quiz. <laughs> who is that? So this is a really good story. So I put this one up here because things like Asia syndrome um, and all this new knowledge that's coming up is sometimes not recognized. And so this particular guy, I'll tell you a bit of the story and maybe you'll end up knowing a bit more. Um, this is the story of stomach ulcers and Helicobacter pylorus. Anybody followed how this came about? So always um, the doctors were, oh, you just have too much stress, that's why you've got a stomach ulcer. So this guy was um, actually working in the Royal Perth Hospital in 1981 when I was a new graduate. And um, he came up with the idea that it could be a bacteria. So um, they tried to culture from the biopsy. So when he looked at biopsies of these stomach ulcers and stained up the biopsies, he saw this little um, spiral shape bacteria all the time. And he went, oh, well that shouldn't be there. Is it causative or correlation? So this is always the thing with science. Is it causative or is it just there? Is it correlative? So he came up with this theory that it could, in fact, be the cause of stomach ulcers. So he was ridiculed, like pretty much all the scientists in the world forever, because the world's flat, right? Everybody knows the world's flat. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, and like like microbiome transplants and fecal microbiomes and and holistic medicine and don't vaccinate annually. It's all weird, right? <laughs> so this guy was out on a limb, and um, so he tried to culture those little spiral things that he got from the biopsies, and. Um, Usually, the culture's about three, three days or so. So one extended long weekend, yay, Australia. Um, Friday and Monday was holidays, and they cultured it up on Wednesday or Thursday. And then they came in and looked at the plates on Tuesday, and they got a growth. And he was like, wow, oh, it's growing, yes. And he identified it. So there's this thing called Cox postulates, which means if this thing causes disease, you have to see it in all the diseases. You have to be able to get that bug out of that disease. You have to grow it, then you have to give it to another organism that's healthy, and that organism has to get sick with that same disease. So that's the postulate. So he grew it, and he's like, okay, so now somebody has to take this bug and find out if they get a stomach ulcer. So who would he do that to? He did it for himself. <laughs> so he's a hero, and his name is Barry Marshall. And the reason I've popped this up is to show you that this is science, this is how it's working, and all of this stuff that's out there now, we're just on the edge, and we see results in the stuff that we do, but we are we are on the edge. <laughs> we all need your support. Um, yeah, so he proved that Helicobacter pylorus caused it because he drank a soup of this stuff, and he gave himself a stomach ulcer, and then he treated it with antibiotics, and he came up with the triple drug therapy, which we all know about now. So it's pretty cool. There's still people today, like I still get dogs that have had a biopsy, it's in there. I get the specialist report, they found it, and they haven't treated it with the triple drug therapy. And this is one where I would use the triple drug, I would use antibiotics for these, because the dog's ongoing and the specialist says, oh well this was found, but we don't know if it's positive. And I'm like, well we do, because of this guy. <laughs> anyway, so you can see. We also want to have um, a better intake of omega-3 versus omega-6. Now, all of our diets nowadays are too high in omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory. So we bottle up omega-3 fatty acids. We use a fish oil and a flaxseed oil, and we blend them. And we recommend pretty much all the patients that come through our door should have a little bit of this. And you don't cook the oils. You just add them fresh on top of the food. Okay, pictures of good bugs. So it depends on, there's also a um, variety of, you probably can't see this because the writing is so small, but um, this is a study done by the, the man that we buy our Entralife probiotics from, and he worked on poo for 30 years in Tasmania and um, the CSIRO and New South Wales Primary Industries. So he found that particular strains um, some of them were good and some of them were bad. So even if it's got the same name, like Lactobacillus acidophilus, not all Lactobacillus acidophilus are created the same. So his name's John Oliver. He actually sent me an email yesterday. Because <coughs> he's trying to introduce his product to the UK, and he wanted me to help him with that. And we really like his product. I came back from Bali um, one year with them. Um, it's not Bali Bali, it was um, Campylobacter, which was bloody diarrhea. So I didn't feel sick, but I had um, drank a bit of a, um, well, it would have been river water basically, <laughs> from um, a lady that was selling like a um, jamu, a turmeric drink. And so I had drank it, I went, oh, that tasted like river water. And I thought about it, I really shouldn't have drunk that. that was bad idea. <laughs> and then within hours I started to feel a bit sick and then I had to go to the toilet like every few minutes and it was bloody, it was not good. And I was flying back that night pretty much so I went back to the hotel and asked for a late check-in and drank ginger tea non-stop, never got dehydrated, never felt really sick but it just wasn't good. I had to go to the toilet all the time. So I flew, I, I did go to the local chemist and, and got some metronidazole. <laughs> There's no problem. They said, are you a doctor? I said, yes, they gave it to me. Um, and then I also took a lot of probiotic um, yogurt from the local supermarket. Yeah. So I wasn't feeling sick, but when I came home, I took the poo sample to the doctors and straight away, and I got Campylobacter, pure growth, bad, bad. And um, it, I, I ate half of the tub of Entralife probiotic as soon as I arrived home, went, went to work, came home, 
ate the other half of the tub and the next day I was better. So you need to really wipe out the bad bugs and overwhelm it with good bugs. So his stuff has inulin in it as well. So it's a symbiotic. It has the probiotic and the prebiotic in it. So it makes it easy. So what's a good bug? You can buy all kinds now of different types of um, probiotics. And you can also make good probiotics yourself. So it's all about keeping your mitochondria, which are the energy part of your cell, um, happy. I was lucky enough to meet Terry Walls a couple of years ago. Terry Walls is a doctor. Um, she's a, a neurologist and a, um, initially she was a GP. And she got multiple sclerosis and was confined to a wheelchair. She's amazing. I really enjoyed hanging out with them. Um, so she's pretty much cured herself. Now, MS is tricky because it waxes and wanes, but for sure she was on the way out and she couldn't walk anymore and she was using all of the medical warfare that she could um, and she was not getting better at all. So she figured out that she needed to give herself bulk, intense, nutrient-dense food, basically 20 cups of vegetables a day. So the best way to do that, we find, is to juice all kinds of stuff going in there and on the color. So you need your beetroots um, and you need your greens, lots and lots of greens. And so if you Google her name and look at her, some of her YouTubes, um, this will show you. So she also recommends eating liver. Liver is very concentrated in vitamin A and D. And it's actually a good food for babies too. So one of their first food should be smashed up liver. So we've got this grandson and granddaughter now and the grandson started on liver, liver pate that I made with butter at home. And he's like ginormous. He's nine months old. He's ticking on all cylinders. He is amazing. So the brain needs to have these, these nutrients and they need good quality fats um, and they need to have this sulfur rich green, um, leafy greens and things in there. So look up Terry Walls. Um, just supplementing with a vitamin cannot give you a balanced diet. This was a dog that was actually referred from the specialist because um, I think when it, they, the specialist decided through ultrasound and CT scans that there was... <laughs> you got Terry Walls. That's yeah. Terry Walls. I really like your voice. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, just turn the volume right down. <laughs> So, so this dog had blood in the pee, um, and their answer was to take the kidney out. We um, supplemented this one with Yunnan Bio, which now I've got a lot of specialists using. I've been teaching them for years now. And um, Yunnan Bio is a Chinese herb that's used in um, epistaxis, so bleeding noses. Um, it was developed in the Yunnan province of China for the Chinese army if they were injured they would take the little red pill in the packet, which is aconite, and um, it helps stop the bleeding, and then the Yunnan Bio tablets to stop the bleeding. So we use that in our cancer patients that have blood and tumors. I put this dog on that and a few other things, and he stopped bleeding. He didn't have his kidney out. So there's lots of things that you can sort of pull together. So there's also trace minerals that are now um, depleted in our soil. So um, we do buy in formic acid minerals and put them in um, bottles and add some to the food. So that's trace minerals that good bacteria need to grow on. Um, another good source of trace minerals is um, mussels and oysters. So we usually tell the clients to use spirulina or oysters or mussels after they make their slow cooked food. One oyster has 30 milligrams of zinc and a bunch of other trace minerals and hopefully none of the bad metals, heavy metals, depending on where they're grown. But um, you will need to supplement for minerals because Australian soils are crap. So we have low copper, low manganese, um, low selenium in our soils, except in some areas. So uh, Brazil nut, ground up to get your selenium and an oyster in your pet's meal every day will help them continue to have good bugs. And just getting back to the point that food is not what it should be. So if you actually read the packet, you'll see things that are generally recognized as safe. And a lot of these are going to destroy your gut biome. So the things that are thought to be safe are things like um, 
color additives. So there's certain um, dyes like the tartrazine yellow, if they're called tar derivative, most of those colors are in fact called tar derivatives. And coal tar is what you make your roads with. And the roads don't fall apart overnight because it kills bacteria. If it, if it didn't, you would have moss and bacteria wrecking your roads, right? So coal tar is actually going to be an antibiotic for your gut. It will kill all your gut bugs. And then there's preservatives. That's why your dry food can have a shelf life of two years because they put things in there that stop bugs growing. So when you swallow them, you're going to stop bugs growing. So when you're eating things, you just have to stop and think, is it food? If it's not food, maybe you shouldn't.
Um, you can use leftover green leaf tea because the caffeine's in the tea of vitamin and the theobromin. So when you make the tea, after you drink it, if there's some leaves left, you can shove some of that in the dog food. Turmeric, I make turmeric bickies fairly regularly and their recipe is on um, Animal Wellness on the Facebook site. Um, marigolds and flowers and nasturtiums, you can add those to the stew. We're eating a lot of nasturtiums at the moment because we've got so many. And they're pretty amazing if you top them up and fry them in a little bit of olive oil and then cook your fish with it. It's pretty cool. Um, CoQ10, um, vitamin C, and these vitamins are all very useful. All kinds of berries are also very useful. Okay, so we know what that is, we know what the bad bugs are. So all of these things are related to bad bugs. So hormone imbalances. Okay, now inulin. You can actually buy inulin from iHerb.com as a white powder. It tastes sweet. It's amazing. Inulin is a prebiotic and it's preferentially eaten by um, good bugs and helps good bugs grow. Now in the latest research for treating autism in children, adding inulin to their diet is easy. They like the taste. The children like the taste. It's a white sweet powder. You can add it to pretty much anything. But it also helps all the other diseases that we were talking about because it basically feeds your good bugs. So what we know is you need more omega-3s, you need more Mediterranean olive oil in the diet, you need more inulin. Inulin is in all of these. So I was growing chicory until I think the possum just completely ate it. So I was picking them out and then chopping it up and adding it to a tuna fish salad with a bit of mayo and doing it quite regularly. And then I went away for a couple of weeks and came home and it was completely gone. I thought my husband must have pulled it out and thought it was a weed. <laughs> but I mean, he said, no, he did it, but it's like completely gone. But we're actually growing some native rats, I found. <laughs> and they're climbing, I've got a um, chocolate pudding fruit tree and my dog's sitting there looking at it last night. And I'm going, okay, we have put the torch on. There's this really cute little rat sitting and eating all my chocolate pudding fruit, which is upsetting, but. Are they like some body? Yeah. Have you got them? Tons, and I can give you. Oh. We've got the seeds and they're all growing. I've That's got really some in good. pots, so if anybody wants to see me at Animal Wellness, because um, the half-eaten fruit falls to the ground and then the ground's pretty <coughs> fertile and they're just sprouting and making more trees. Yeah. So if anybody wants, I've got a few, I'll put them in pots. That and nasturtiums out of my ears and then in a few weeks' time, we have a um, Indonesian native ginseng that's a weed in my garden. My garden is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I've got spurge to treat um, SCC and BCC. So like all these things just grow like weeds. <laughs> so I think, oh, poor, poor leaf. So I tre helped treating a friend who was dying of prostate cancer with meds. So I made him 20 litres of poor, poor leaf tea, and he rang me yesterday. His PSA has gone from 17,000 to less than 100, and wow. he's doing them. Yeah, so all this stuff you need to know, you need to share it, yeah. Um, where are we? We're almost done, I think. Yeah, so vitamins you need. Oh, I did want to share this one. So this is my Kelpie that I had before, and she was um, well, over-vaccinated, not as much as most dogs, but this is before I knew as much as I know now. And I used to eat the two-minute um, Maggi noodles fairly regularly because it's easy. So, um, and they have a packet of flavoring in there that has tartrazine yellow dye in it, which is that coal tar that I told you causes cancer. Um, and so, you know, chicken flavored. So MSG, <laughs> um, which actually makes your B6, by the way, vitamin B6. So again, it's all about the gut microbiome. So um, I would put things in there like broccoli and some carrots and some onions. And so I'd make them all up and then the leftovers I'd give to the dog minus the onions. And that's what happened to her eyes, like inside the house, no access to anything else. So it didn't go outside. So her eyes all puffed up and I had to give her an antihistamine and I went, oh crap. So Chinese food syndrome. Okay. How long did that take to happen to the dog's house? Oh, 20 minutes after she ate the food. Yeah. 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 Sad, yeah? And this 
is, so even if they don't show it like that on the outside, that can happen on the inside. Um, and this is how you get, you know, autoimmune diseases and things like that. So are there antioxidants that help mop them up? So we've talked about that before, catechins are in the um, green leaf peas, but it's very important to feed these. The sulfur-containing cruciferous vegetables, super important. So I really like Brussels sprouts, so do my um, grandson and my son. Um, cooking them up with some butter, amazing. It's, just, it's my preference to eat these things, and obviously my body needs them. Um, but this is in our anti-cancer diet, so just remember to add those to the food. Regularly you'll grow good buds. Okay, so if you've got irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease, this, this is my go-to. What you need to do is you need to stop the gluten, the corn, and the maize. I do have a problem with that because I like popcorn. Um, and then you need to feed species-appropriate fresh food. So, so cats need to have about 90% meat almost, but they do need the um, calcium in there. And then there's some acupuncture points that you can use, and then you need to add some good quality probiotics. So that's the Entropro that we were talking about before that we buy in and consider fecal microbiome transplants. Make sure that there's lots of the prebiotics, which is the veggie pulp. Make sure you use some B12 by injection. If your gut is so inflamed, you're not going to be able to absorb the B12 orally as you need. That's why you need to inject it. And you can just get it from the chemist. And we can help you supply some needles and syringes. <laughs> Actually, I think they'll supply them for you as well nowadays. And then you need the herbs that will help calm the um, sympathetic system and stimulate the parasympathetic system. So these are the names of some herbs that do that. And there you go. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's tea and coffee. So now we have a break. Yeah, yeah there's tea and coffee and some snacks over there. And, and we can take questions after the snacks. You can <laughs> ask her a question while you're eating. <laughs> 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 <laughs>